Tonight we are in Norwich. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, Brandon Lewis, the government security minister till recently, Conservative Party chairman under Theresa May, Labour's shadow housing secretary and a former minister in the Blair and Brown governments, John Healy, Geoffrey Donaldson, Chief Whip at Westminster for the Democratic Unionist Party and Northern Ireland's longest serving current MP. Catherine Bernard, Professor of EU Law at Cambridge University and Senior Fellow of the research group UK in a Change in Europe. And broadcaster, journalist and author of a book on British identity and race, Afua Hirsch. Welcome to our panel, to you at home and of course to our audience here. I'm pleased to say a thousand people here in Norwich applied to be in the audience. We have not quite as many of that here tonight, but you're obviously keen to get involved. So you're very welcome and you can argue along as well at home using the usual way, hashtag BBCQT, on Facebook, on Instagram and on Twitter. So get stuck in. Right, let's have our first question tonight, which is from Richard Rallison. Uh, Yellowhammer. Should this now be the end to any further discussions on a no-deal Brexit? John Healy. Yes. This is, the, this is the truth the government tried to hide. It proves that Parliament was right to force it to disclose this report. Um, and this report <clears throat> sets out what is the number one government planning. Food and fuel price hikes, uh, chaos on the crossing of the Channel, uh, and the hard risk of a return to a hard border in Northern Ireland. And they're doing this not because they want to leverage a better deal. No one believes that, including Boris Johnson's own brother. Um, they're doing it because this is a party, the Conservative Party, that's been taken over and is being turned into a, an extreme hard-right faction. Those are not my words, but Philip... Hammond's words. That's what's at stake. That's why this is important. And that's why Parliament should be back doing its job in Parliament this week instead of being now shut down for five days, five weeks, so that we can, we can challenge the government, get the public the information they've been trying to hide. The document that was revealed yesterday, the reasonable worst-case scenario. Having read what's in there, so you were familiar with it, I assume, before it came out uh, yesterday, should this be the end of discussions on a no-deal Brexit? Well, I think, let's just be clear, because there's a couple of things in what John said, I'm sure he wouldn't want to be misleading people, that aren't quite true. Um, the reality is, what Yellowhammer is, and bear in mind this was the 2nd of August, so it's based on the work that was primarily done by the last government, and what's happened since the 2nd of August with the new government is every single day uh, we meet in what's called EXO, and I've been to quite a lot of those. They're chaired every day by Michael Gove, that is doing all of the planning for leaving the European Union on the 31st of October. Now, we've can actually I, said... Can I just ask you about that? Because given the law that was passed last week, which has taken no deal off the table for October 31st, why aren't you still planning for it? Well, because I think it is right. The government is actually prepared for any outcome. Now, but that's, we are that's doing, the law. Well, we are doing work to make sure that we are ready for a deal, and I, I'm still confident we will get a deal. I think the Prime Minister's position is absolutely right. Bear in mind that the next Council of Europe is 17th, 18th of October, um, and I think we will get a deal there. But it is right that we have been preparing. So why Michael Gove said in his letter to Hilary Benn and, uh, that was published yesterday that we will be publishing an updated um, re review of uh, effectively the Yellowham of where we have got to over the last few weeks because we are in a very, very good state of readiness for when we leave the European Union, which we will do on the 31st of October. But not with no deal because that's been taken off the table now. We will week. leave the European Union on the 31st of October. I'm confident we leave, we leave with a deal. And of course, a lot of the work that we were doing and are doing to be ready for any outcome is as applicable to leaving with a deal as it is to leaving without a deal. The man there in the blue shirt. Um, if John believes um, so rigorously that. Um, the, uh, the Conservatives are obviously becoming this um, extremist party, then um, why do you not let the, the, us, uh, the public, decide, um, you know, and give them the mandate or, or throw them out of government, you know, and then we can choose the people we do want to represent us? Obviously, Norwich is a um, predominantly Remain uh, a city. Um, 
but we should be given that opportunity to be able to decide. And if, if we don't want that extremist view that you talk about, then they won't get elected. So we, we as the people should be able to decide, um, not, the, not, not Parliament effectively, because you, at the moment you're passing laws which are basically before the election, should, should they not stand on a manifesto and us decide. So what you're saying is you want a general election? I want a general election because I feel that people, the people... <laughs> Quite right, because I also want people to have a chance to pass their judgment on ten years of this Tory government and three years of their failure on Brexit. I want people to have the chance to choose a £10 an hour national minimum wage, a national care service, and a government that's set to give private renters proper rights and build a million affordable homes. But, first and foremost, our duty, and we made this pledge in our 2017 election, was to make sure that Britain could not be crashed out by Boris Johnson in a no deal at the end of October. And I have to say, this Yellowhammer report vindicates that cross-party push, that doubt about what Boris Johnson was really up to, and forcing it to disclose the detail well, of what respect. the government is actually planning for. With all due respect, though, if, if, if that's, the, if that's what you, you stood for in your manifesto, you weren't elected, so effectively the elected government has decided to to go down whatever path, path they wish at the moment, if we disagree with it as the people, then we can vote on that well, for a general okay, election. Okay, hang on. There, 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 can I answer that point? Very briefly. an important one. There is no mandate for a no-deal Brexit. There's no majority yes, there in the country. There's no majority in Parliament a for a no-deal Brexit. Brexit. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's bring it back to what we're talking. Should this be the end of discussions on a no-deal Brexit? Well, this, this Prime Minister hasn't been elected as a result of a general election, by the way. I, I think there's a lot you can criticise the Labour position on Brexit. I think it's been deeply flawed for a long time. But on this, I don't think you can criticise Labour. So much of our government and governance is built on trust in this country. This government has, has triggered a complete breakdown in trust on multiple occasions. We have had a cabinet minister resigning in the last week, stating that what the government says it's doing, which is taking a deal as seriously as no deal, is not actually what's going on. So we have You're to take... Amber Rudd. I'm talking about Amber Rudd's resignation. We have to take Operation Yellowhammer seriously because the government has said, and we've just heard again, that even though now a law has been passed stating that no deal should be taken off the table, this government is still taking us towards a no deal situation. This is a possible outcome of no deal and it's incredibly serious. And I have to say, I'm astonished by the dismissiveness with which I've seen Conservative ministers treat these extremely serious potential outcomes of a no deal Brexit. There's, there's, <laughs> lots, you know, there's, there's lots of panelists. I just want to get around quite a few of you. Yes, the, the man in the white t shirt at the back there. Um, I just want to ask Brandon Lewis this question. Um, just picking up on a point you said earlier about getting a deal. Well, what I want to know is how on earth the Tories are going to get this deal through Parliament because the EU has said this withdrawal agreement is closed. The only th tweaks that can be made are to the political declaration. So how are you going to get a deal, so the withdrawal agreement, that lost three times in Parliament, through Parliament, between the 17th of October and the 31st of October? Please tell me that. <laughs> Well, there's a, there's a couple of things to say, and also picking up on the points um, just made here by the panel. So, first of all, the work of Operation Yellowhammer, the work that we are doing in government to prepare for whether we leave with a deal, without a deal, or anything between. But hang on, the law says you can't about, leave no, no, with but, no but, deal. But so, why are you so The work, the work we are doing is not about doing that work because we want to leave with a deal. We've been very clear without a deal. We want to leave with a deal. We want to get a deal at the European Council on the 17th and 18th of October. Look, as somebody who, you know, it's a, it's a few years ago, but I, when I was in business, and I think most people you talk to them, when you are negotiating, you want to keep everything on the table so the people you're negotiating with know that you, are, you have got those no negotiations off the table in your now. pocket. That was the law well, last week. Well, as I say, we are, but we are very clear, the Prime Minister is very clear, we are going to leave the European Union on 31st October. Parliamentarians have blocked this for far too long. We have got to deliver on what everybody voted for in 2016. And if John believes what he said, he had two options, two chances last week to vote for a general election that we could have had before the European Council. And if he believes he can win it, he could have come have back an and an done those negotiations. You haven't answered okay. my question. But we can okay. do you that. Haven't let, answered let me, my let me move because we, Brandon has talked quite a bit. Catherine, put us out of our misery. So, in answer to the question, should this be put an end to a no deal? Well, actually, 
Remember, even though um, there is the Hillary Benn Act, um, the reality is that it takes two to tango and any um, request for an extension requires the EU to agree to it. And if the EU says no, there will be a no-deal scenario. And so, therefore, the Operation Yellow Hammer is important for identifying what the risks are. And you've just come back from Brussels. Do you think the EU saying no to an extension is looking likely? I think it's uh, less likely, particularly if it's tied up with having an election or a second referendum. But remember, too, that the Hillary Benn Act um, is actually only takes us to the end of January. And there is a reasonable chance that if there's an extension um, and then we get to the end of January, we would still be looking at a no-deal scenario. So the legal practicalities are that the government is right, it does need to keep preparing for a no deal. And on the content of Operation Yellow Hammer, I think what we can say is certainly uh, the government has put a lot of resource into it, about 12,000 civil servants are working on this. And remember, it's not just the British side, it's also the EU side. And the EU have made a number of concessions. These are not mini deals, but they're concessions which will allow, for example, in the event of a no deal, of uh, uh, British truck drivers to carry on using their British license, but only until the end of December, because of course all of the planning was done in anticipation that we'd be leaving on um, the 29th of March 2019 rather than October. But there are there is planning being done on both sides. Uh, Geoffrey Johnson, when you read the uh, oper Operation Yellowhammer, it must have concerned you, particularly given the effect on farmers in Northern Ireland, businesses that are, that are trading across the border. Well, of course, and that's why, um, like Brandon, uh, we believe the best way to leave the European Union is with a deal, uh, and we're working at that. Uh, I don't accept that it's impossible to get a deal. I think it is. And actually, contrary to what's been said, um, some of the uh, statements being made now by the Irish government in particular are, are, I think, a lot more positive. The Taoiseach, when he met the Prime Minister on Monday of this week, uh, said that the Irish government were prepared to now consider alternative arrangements to the backstop. The um, EU Trade Commissioner, who is also Irish, said this week that the EU were prepared to consider alternative arrangements. So I think that we're beginning to, to see a shift. I think there is the prospect now of getting a deal. Um, and uh, frankly, that is by far the best outcome for the UK, including for Northern Ireland. Man here in the front in the dark shirt. If Boris Johnson doesn't care about the law of the land, why should I? Right. Well, if you'll forgive me, because I, I have a feeling we might get on to that. I think you might be talking about the judgment in the Scottish Court subject. Can we just stick with the subject hand of the which is Operation Yellowhammer? The, the man in the blue shirt there in the, in the middle. If we go back to Yellowhammer, then the question, and we're looking at the, the possible worst-case scenarios, one of them being a border in Northern Ireland, I never woke up in the morning ever feeling deeply oppressed by the EU. But we're taking a risk here with Brexit are finding ourselves in a position where we've got renewed conflict in Northern Ireland. Do we not owe it to the people who lost lives, limbs and loved ones in those troubles to avoid anything that might cause a renewal of conf conflict at all costs? Whether you voted Brexit or whether you voted Remain, I'm sure we can all agree that it's not worth going back there. I'm going to take a few points if I may. I just wanted to take issue with the idea that having a general election is the best way to resolve this problem democratically. Because I, I live in a Leave constituency. Uh, there's a huge majority for my current MP. My vote is meaningless in this current situation, and it is very demotivating and depressing when I care deeply about what's going on in our country right now. Can hear the black um, I think, because obviously to, to re-elect someone into parliament is going to take us about 23 days for that announcement to be made to the public. Clearly with the prorogation that is going on right now, that has been taken away. Democracy in this country is dead now. What's the point in telling us, come, come and vote? Because looking at how we got to this position, young people didn't have a clear say. We didn't know what was going on. We just got told, this is the next move, but nobody explained this is what's going to be involved in everything that's happening now. So I don't think not having a gener general election is the right thing to do right now. Thank you. The man in the check shirt. Well, having a general election is all very well, but uh, what is the point of electing a government if you're not going to let the government govern? 
Yes, because of course the government has a minority. Uh, 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 we talked about Operation Yenham. I just want to take a slightly different tack with it. Can we hear from Gaina Smith? Gaina, where are you? Yeah. Hi. Um, we're hearing what will happen with No Deal, um, but can we quantify the likely economic damage that will be caused by further delaying Brexit? So, just taking a different tack on it for a moment. So, Brad, and obviously you don't want to further delay Brexit. No, I think... I mean, you've changed your position a few times because you're a big supporter of Theresa May's deal. And you thought No Deal would be really damaging. But now you're... I think the Theresa May's deal is terrible, and that no deal wouldn't no, be so no, bad. No, 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 no. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> no, no, that's not quite a fair representation. Look, I, look I've been very... I, but you I, certainly I don't want to curious. delay Brexit. No, look, I don't want to delay Brexit, and I think this is about... You know, as politicians, we often get criticised because we don't change our view when the situation changes, and actually, I think the situation has changed. Look, I've, I voted... I've been upfront about this. I voted Remain originally. Um, I did that for a couple of clear reasons, not least all the energy industry in my own constituency. But I'm a Democrat, and there was a decision to leave, and I think we have to leave. Now, I, do, I, was, I was quite happy with Theresa May deal, but Parliament said no. And, I, and the reality is Parliament three times said no to that deal. So we've got to find a deal that we can get through Parliament. I would still prefer to leave with a deal. I think we can leave with a deal. I and think what we do you think the damage would be to come to Guinness point in think, delaying Brexit? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, I think it's very difficult to assess what the economic damage of delay will be. It creates further uncertainty, although obviously whether we live with a deal or without a deal, there is going to be a period where we've got to negotiate trade agreements both with our partners in the EU and elsewhere. Uh, but if we have left with a deal, of course, we've got that transition period that gives business certainty. So I think that is obviously good for them. For me, the reason I think we have to leave in October is with parliamentarians several times having let people down on leaving when we should have already left, and we should have left already, I think to go beyond October the 31st would be hugely damaging for democracy. We haven't yet done what we said we would do, which is do what the people would be going to vote on, and we had the referendum, a decision was made. My view as Democrats is we must deliver on that. I think to delay it again would be a massive hit for democracy. And just very briefly, to come to the gentleman's point in the front row, I think you make a very good point. This is again why last week we wanted Parliament to have a general election because we could have had the general election, had the new Prime Minister with a mandate, before the next European Council. But having said he wants a general election, John and his colleagues twice Sorry. voted against it. Uh, Geoffrey Johnson, you, you, the DUP's been in and out of number 10 this week. Again, this question is about what's the, what, what would be the drawback of delaying Brexit. You obviously don't want to delay Brexit, you want to get this sorted. What kind of deal would you accept now in order to get Brexit through? Well, as far back as August 2016, the Northern Ireland Executive, and it was still functioning at that stage, um, gave a clear indication to the then Prime Minister of the kind of arrangements we felt were appropriate for Northern Ireland. And that still stands. We recognise that a lot of our trade um, in the agri-food sector, for example, is cross-border, so we want to protect that. And that means making arrangements with the EU to enable that trade to continue. But what we don't want to do is create a new trade barrier and tariffs between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, because Great Britain is by far our biggest market. And someone, uh, a gentleman made the point earlier about the peace process, and I, I cherish the peace process. I had members of my family uh, uh, and uh, uh, friends who died during the Troubles, and I don't want that for my children or my grandchildren in the future. I want a stable, prosperous Northern Ireland, and the prosperity of Northern Ireland is um, absolutely crucial to the success of the peace process and being part of the UK, being part of the fifth largest economy in the world is hugely important for us. And, but this and idea, Geoffrey, that, that, uh, of what's been referred to as a blood red line by Arlene Foster, of having a, a barrier down, the, down the, the sea between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that's something you don't want to see, but it looks like that's something increasing that, that may be considered. I don't think it will. The Prime Minister has made clear that... Has um, he assured you of that? He, he has, absolutely, that we're not talking about creating a second border. I mean, we have enough problems with one border on the island of Ireland. Having two borders, frankly, I don't think is a solution. Um, and it would be economically devastating for Northern Ireland to be cut off in trading terms from Great Britain. So that isn't the solution. I think there are practical arrangements that can be put in place to facilitate cross-border trade. We are already agreed on a common travel area between Ireland and the United Kingdom, so the movement of people uh, is uh, unimpeded. Um, and I think uh, we can um, come up with sensible um, alternatives uh, that negate the need for this backstop. I mean, the, the EU's not been convinced by any other alternatives for the last three well, years. Well, I, I, 
uh, again repeat that I think the noises coming from Brussels and coming from Dublin in particular um, uh, indicate that there is more flexibility now, that they are willing to look at these ideas and find a sensible solution. And look, as much as I don't want a no-deal outcome for the UK, I know that Dublin don't want a no-deal outcome okay. either because it would be devastating for their economy too. So there is a mutual interest in getting a deal okay, well, and I think it's possible. Catherine, you just come back from Brussels. What are you hearing about whether there's any movement in the EU getting us closer to a deal? Yeah, I I'm certainly was hearing that there is interest in some sort of flexible solution, whether it might be um, around having uh, Northern Ireland staying in the uh, single area for agri-foods, which is uh, food, uh, uh, plant and animal products, or um, a combination of staying in um, the single market's common regulatory area for those sorts of things, plus using technology to try to address uh, some of the other issues. Because remember, agri-food is only about 30% of, of, the, of the market. So is it looking more possible now to you? Well, is it that, is, is that possible. What you're it, it is. It, it, what's interesting, of course, this is the backstop, and the backstop is an insurance policy. Yeah. And uh, it is worth bearing that in mind. It's only going to be triggered if there is no future deal successfully negotiated at the end of the transition period. And so what you're seeing, and just remember it, the, the sequencing here, the sequencing is the divorce deal, which has got the backstop in it, and then the, the divorce deal will take us into transition, which ties into with the question that was asked about the cost of delaying Brexit. Actually, if we go into transition, it's broadly status quo, at least as far as the rules are concerned, and then, in an ideal world, we then go into our new relationship. And if that were to happen, then uh, you don't need to engage the Irish backstop at all. The problem is negotiating a future trade deal may well take much longer than the two years of the transition period. Also, the problem is the Irish backstop, as we've heard many, many times. Yes, the, the man back there in the, in the dark yeah. top. No, I right at the back there, oh. with the white hair. Um, we keep talking about the backstop, but Labour won't even pass the backstop when they put it to Parliament. So, therefore, why are we still talking about it? It's either got to be put through or not put through, and we need to move on. This government has, has now got five weeks through prorogation to talk to Europe and get things sorted without everybody giving it in their ear. Then they can come back with a deal. Then you can see what you've got. Then we have a general election, and that will be for the referendum. I mean, if you had voted for the draw deal and a backstop, we wouldn't be in this position, would we? The duty of government after that That's referendum was to negotiate a proper deal that safeguarded jobs and avoided the risk, as the Yellowhammer report still says there is, of a hard border in Northern Ireland. And Theresa May's deal didn't have the support of the public, didn't have the support of the, uh, in Parliament. It is not good enough. That's what's needed. And if, if, if you can't negotiate a deal, if you have no proposals. And Michel Barnier in Brussels today said there's not been proposals from this government that justify reopening those negotiations. And that's what Amber Rudd said less than a week ago. When she resigned, she said 80 to 90 percent of this government's time is spent on preparing for no deal. And you have to conclude that's the real plan, not getting not getting a good deal, not getting a better deal, but crashing us out. And that's why I have to say, Brandon, you lost. The, Boris Johnson lost the trust, you lost the confidence, and that's why you've lost 21 of your most senior, most serious politicians who are now no longer Conservative MPs because they simply can't um, bear to be and to go with Boris Johnson. That's a dreadful statement. <laughs> To, to gain this question, can we quantify the likely economic damage by further delaying Brexit? I think for people outside Westminster watching this, it's very hard to understand why we have seen a bit of movement in the last, just in the last few hours even, about the potential for a, a new deal that solves the problem in Northern Ireland. Why now, with no deal looming days away, it's only now that we're seeing what finally seemed like potentially meaningful negotiations. And to come to the question of the cost of delaying Brexit, I think there's this false view that people like me who voted Remain just want to thwart Brexit by whatever means. And I remind people that the majority of MPs, most of whom voted Remain, voted to trigger Article 50. People accepted the result of the refer referendum and acted in good faith, assuming that negotiations would be 
properly carried out and we would be able to leave with a deal that didn't leave us in an economically catastrophic situation. The result of that not having happened is that now no one can quantify the cost, not only of delaying Brexit, but also of the breakdown now of our democratic institutions, a government that has shown its disregard for the rule of law, attacks on the judiciary and the uncertainty that's affected the currency, the housing market that's affecting trade. These, the damage has already been done. And so in a way, there's a lose-lose scenario playing itself out that even if now, finally, belatedly, we do see some kind of sensible negotiation and a deal, so much has already been lost in the confidence and image of this country. And I think for so many people watching, also our confidence in the parliamentary process, and especially this government, is completely broken. OK, well, that brings us on to our next question. Paul Good evening. Um, if the Supreme Court upholds the ruling that Boris Johnson lied and acted unlawfully, should he resign? Catherine is our legal expert on the panel. Obviously, this is a reference to the, the Scottish judges who ruled yesterday yeah. that Boris Johnson actually there's a I could, I, could, uh, I could quote them, but, but they basically said that Boris Johnson stymied Parliament uh, by, by suspending it. And, the act, and by doing so, he acted unlawfully. The ruling of the Scottish court um, was really quite striking in the strength of its language. The full report hasn't been published yet, but the press release that's been issued by the court was written in pretty strong language. Lord Brodie, for example, um, talked about the egregious case of a clear failure to comply with generally accepted standards of behaviour. I mean, this is really quite striking for judges to speak in, this, um, in these terms. Um, and the three judges in the Scottish uh, court agreed on that point. Um, the uh, the Gina Miller case, which is being brought through the courts of England and Wales, uh, the judges decided that they wouldn't um, take a view on the substantive issue that you mentioned for the simple reason that they thought that the decision to prorogue was not justiciable, which is legal speak for th that the courts should not be able to decide this point because it was a matter of high politics. And the, it was a political decision whether to uh, advise the Queen to prorogue Parliament. Now, in answer to your question, if it's found, which way will the Supreme Court go and the consequence of that? Well, this is really, this is, shows just how, the limits of our constitution because what, you've got one court saying this is really a political uh, matter and another court saying this is a legal matter, it goes to the core of our constitution. And for the Supreme Court, it's going to have to make that, that choice which way to go. And a lot of commentators say, well, they'll probably say it's high politics, therefore the court shouldn't get involved. But that has got implications. Then. Is that what you think will happen? I think that's what the general, a lot of people say. But, of course, we were, a lot of people were very wrong in the Gina Miller case last time round. Um, but it would be, if they said it's high politics, um, therefore the courts don't get involved, therefore, if that's what they've defined, then, of course, Boris Johnson um, should remain as Prime Minister. So, so, Brandon, it's all been going so well, hasn't it? So, Boris Johnson has... He's divided your party, he's united the opposition, he's lost all the votes, and now you've got this Scottish judge saying he misled the Queen and, and all, all of us. Could it get any worse? Well, I think let's also be very clear about what's actually happening. Firstly, yes, we had the Scottish judgment yesterday. There's obviously been an English court judgment, high I mean, court. What did you think? Well, did, was that like a sucker punch when you? Well, saw we've that? also had the English high court, and I think it was, the, from memory, it was the Lord Chief Justice who actually ruled with the government on this, as Catherine just right. So well, I think what, the, what they said was it's not for it's them not to interfere. Thing, yeah. They didn't say and Boris think, Johnson was right. And I think they I just saw, said they weren't going to yeah, get involved. I, and I believe the Nor in Northern Ireland we had the same from a court today. Next week, the UK Supreme Court will have to make a decision about this, and as we, we, you know, we will abide by um, what the court's saying. We, we follow the rule of law. But let's also be very clear about where and why this has come about. Despite what John said in his opening remarks a short while ago, this is the longest session of Parliament in about 400 years. And Boris Johnson said when he became... Uh, and the Prime longest Minister, prorogation. But, well, uh, let's, let, I'll just come to it. Let's just think about the timeline here. No, Boris Johnson was very clear when he became Prime Minister, we want to get on with the job. We want to be investing and moving forward with NHS, investing and moving forward with education, with safety of people. We want to make, make sure that we're secure and able to make those kind of decisions with a really exciting domestic agenda. That requires a Queen's speech. 
Now, the but, Queen's speech. But when, just, you do the, just... when you have the Queen's speech, given you haven't got a majority, how are you going to get any of well, it through? What's well, the that's, point? Th that is the job of government to get a Queen's speech through, and obviously that is but, also a conversation. But how can you? You haven't well, got a majority. If, if you let me just finish on the timeline point, the Queen's speech comes back on the 14th of October. The European Council is on the 17th, 18th. As I said earlier on, John and his party had a chance to what they said they wanted to have a general election before that European Council. But it gave Parliament plenty of time to have a debate and a discussion around that, but also to get on domestic agenda. And you have to have a Queen's speech for that. We need to probe for that. And actually, in reality, allowing for the party conferences, unless John's going to tell us tonight Labour are counselling their party conference, actually we're talking four or five days difference from what it would have been just for the party conferences. Well, John, you may well tell us that. I wait with bated breath, but hang on, we're just going to get to the audience first. Yes, the man there in the blue shirt. We, we don't know what will happen next, uh, next week in the Supreme Court. We know what happened in the Scottish Court. <laughs> But what I'm concerned about at the moment, already, um, uh, concerned about respect for the judiciary. We had, a, we, we had a business minister from the government yesterday, and I quote, saying that people believe, people, there's a risk that people believe judges are politically motivated. And then we've also got to, uh, newspapers showing biographies of these terrible um, Scottish judges in the newspaper. Um, this, uh, and then we, months ago, we had, uh, you know, one newspaper calling them the enemies of the people. Now, you know, I, I really do think that I wonder now what kind of country we are living in if we can't respect the, the impartiality of the judiciary. What was your response then? Because you're referring to the remarks made by Quasi Quartet, where he said... I'm not saying that the judges are interfering, but many others say, are saying that. Isn't that a bit like saying, for example, I'm not saying he's guilty, but lots of people are saying he is. I mean, well, quasi, did as, you agree with him? As, well, as the gentleman rightly said, Quasi was outlining what he has had people say to him. I, I have to say my own view, and like a couple of other people on the panel, I was a long time ago originally qualified as a lawyer and a barrister. I believe in the independence of the judiciary. The Prime Minister has been very clear about that today as well. And I think it is right we respect their independence. We have got an English, we've got three courts now have looked at this and we're going to have the Supreme Court next week. And I think we need to wait and see what the Supreme Court say. Yes, young woman there. Yeah. All I want to know really is how are we meant to trust the Prime Minister when all we've heard since he became Prime Minister is that he's lying and he's cheating. Like we can't trust somebody that has such a high power when that's all we're hearing, all we're hearing is negative things. The man there in the dark <laughs> Uh, I just want to say I think it's uh, pretty obvious to everyone actually how uh, the Tories are going to get support back and that's by uh, bribing other MPs as they did uh, in the 2017 election. I was wondering, um, yeah, just uh, how much money went to the DUP again, how many billions when, uh, you know, there was some talk of money going to the NHS or something like that. If just didn't know. You're talking about the bus? I was talking about the bus, yeah. <laughs> Let's hear. Uh, you asked the question originally. I just wanted to... And you've been trying to get your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to throw it back to Brendan because um, I don't feel he actually answered my question. It was just a yes or no. Um, well, that would um, be a challenge. Go on, Brendan. <laughs> Let's have a yes or no. Go on, make a yes it a yes or, or no or question. No. Um, you, you talk about a, a few courts and it's gone this way, that way. But this is going to the Supreme Court on Tuesday. Yeah. If, and it is an if, but if they rule that the Prime Minister has lied and acted unlawfully, i.e. broken the law, should he resign, Brendan? Well, you're going to, yes love, or no? you're going to love me for giving you a political answer, because I've got to say to you, we don't know what the UPA... OK, so we're not going to get an answer. All right, OK, we're not going to get an answer. We're going to move on, because you've talked a lot. No, in sure answer is yes or no, because I don't believe that's what's going to okay, happen. John. But we'll see what the court says, and they're independent. And if it is? OK, if that, no, I think that's as far as you're going to get. Okay. Trust me. John. <laughs> I think Paul's spot on, Brandon. The problem is that nobody believes the only reason for shutting down Parliament for five weeks was the Queen's speech. And now we've had a court. I mean, it's astonishing, actually, that we're even, there's even a doubt or a debate about we have a Prime Minister who can be trusted and will follow the law. And now we've had a court that has said, look, he's actually been lying about the reasons for shutting down Parliament and proroguing it for five weeks. We're even told in this judgment yesterday he's lied to the Queen and he's lied to the country. To be honest, let's, he should be in Parliament, he should be there to answer questions, we should be there calling him to account and we should be there from the beginning of next week. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Johnson.
Well, look, if people are not happy with the government and not happy with the Prime Minister, there is a very simple answer. We have a general election and let the people decide. Yeah. Um, you know, for months and months and months and months, we had Jeremy Corbyn and his colleagues demanding a general election. And when they had the opportunity this week twice to vote for a general election, they ran away from that opportunity. So, you know, when I, when I hear people, when I hear people, well, they ran away from it because I rather suspect that given the deep divisions in the Labour Party, um, that, that they don't want an election right now. But if, if, if uh, uh, you know, people have an issue uh, and want to have their say, a general election uh, gives people that opportunity to, to do it. Now, we've got a few weeks here. And I think that we've got to give the Prime Minister a chance to see if he can bring back a deal to Parliament. Because if we can get a deal, and I believe we can, uh, then that will uh, help to resolve the Brexit issue. We will then have a general election and people can give their verdict. Uh, and I think that's a sensible way to deal with this now. Give the government uh, uh, a few weeks, given all that we've had. We've had hundreds of hours of debate in Parliament on Brexit. Hundreds of hours of it. I think now let's give the Prime Minister a few weeks to see if he can deliver that deal um, and he brings it back to Parliament and then we go to the country. And that, I think, is the fairest and best way of dealing th with this once and for all. If the most senior court that has ruled on this matter says that Boris Johnson can't be trusted not to mislead the Queen, why should we trust him not to mislead us? about a general election. Since that's the reality that we're dealing with, this is a Prime Minister who a very senior court has said used a false motive to prorogue Parliament at an existential moment of crisis in our democracy. That is so serious. And, you know, it's very difficult to predict what the Supreme Court will say, but we are in uncharted territory. We have a former Supreme Court Justice, a former Attorney General, the Shadow Attorney General, the General Counsel of Wales, uniting in their submissions to the Supreme Court, which we'll hear next week, that this government has used an improper purpose to suspend scrutiny in Parliament because it feels it's interfering with its Brexit plans. And on top of that, on top of that, as if that's not serious enough, we also have senior figures from the government again attacking our judiciary. Now, I know Kwasi Kwarteng tried to distance himself from those remarks, but is it too much to ask to look for our government to show leadership? If we know people are going to attack the judges, as factions of our press have done in the past, could we not hope that a minister would actually show moral leadership and say, we in this country are proud of our constitution. We are proud of our principles of judicial impartiality, separation of powers, rule of law, and democratic accountability. Instead of showing leadership, this government is trashing them, and it's a total disgrace. Before we move on, I just want to tell you that Question Time comes next week from Southampton. And the week after that, we will be in Cardiff. So if you'd like to join in, call 0330 You can call us see if you'd like to be part of the audience, or you can follow the instructions on the website um, and see if you want to join in. We'd very much like to have you there. Now, a question came in, which I have to say, when I saw it, it gave me pause and it made me chuckle slightly. So I'm going to throw it out there, see what you make of this. Can we hear from Charlie Neal? Hello. How do I sue David Cameron for causing mental distress, uncertainty and proroguing any progress in reasonable government? <laughs> and of course, David Cameron's book's about to come out. He's going to be doing a whole round of interviews, I think, starting next week. Yeah. <laughs> Who shall I start? Well, Brandon, I'm tempted to start with you, because it must have been pretty stressful for you, given us, <laughs> particularly given the sort of... Well, not Damascene conversion, the sort of changes of heart you've had going from, as we said, you know, from Theresa May to, to, to where we are now. Well, look, I, Is I, it all David Cameron's fault, ultimately? Are you, are you, how do you regard it? I mean, are you furious with him? Are you pleased with what happened? Do you think, oh, this is great, I was really hoping this is how it would turn out? Well, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, well, thank you for coming to me first on that one. <laughs> uh, look, no, I think, first of all, just to be very clear, as I said earlier on, look, for me, it's not about um, conversions or changes of heart. For me, it's about being a Democrat, respecting that vote, respecting the vote of Parliament, although I disagree with what happened in March. I think John and his colleagues were given a chance to vote for something they as a party claim they supported and voted against it. 
as they did a general election last week. Um, but actually, I think if you look back to where the country was in 2014, 2015, what David did was give the country something I think we needed to do, which was to have that chance for several generations. You know, I never had a vote first time around. I was too young for that when, with the uh, European Union. To have a chance to have their say on the European Union. And we said we would respect that vote. The problem we've had, and actually the difficulty we've had over the last few years, is parliamentarians not respecting the vote result of 2016. And we have to do that. Actually, when Charlie asked this question, Charlie, I'm going to come back to you, so I want to hear what you think. Yes, the man there in the corner in the T-shirt. Uh, I, I find it staggering you can talk about MPs changing their opinion and yet you deny the public to voice their opinion <laughs> after three years of information. <laughs> Why well, we need a general election. Mm. The, the, woman just, the woman just in front of you there, yes. Me. Um, well, I think you have served democracy because you've been working on Brexit for three years. You, the referendum said that we would get a deal. There is a deal. So I think you have been very democratic. And the problem is that you haven't asked us again, is this now what we want? Charlie, let me just ask you, Charlie, you asked the question, what, how do you think David Cameron will be? Regarded. What's his legacy as far as you're concerned? Oh, I don't care. Tell you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, just tell us what you really think, why don't you? The whole thing's a nightmare. I'm just sick and tired. You've had three years, three months, done nothing apart from arguing amongst yourselves like little kids. You have no respect for each other, you have no respect for the British people. Just, oh, just <laughs> go away. <laughs> I don't think Cameron's the problem. I think the MPs who've had three years to collaboratively work together to get a deal and reinforce and deliver what the people told them to, Parliament isn't sovereign, the people are sovereign. And Parliament has been in contempt of the people, in my opinion. And we need an election. <laughs> There's been quite a few calls for an election. Afro, let's just come back to the point about David Cameron. I mean, we haven't seen much of him, have we? And, then we? and we've had reports of when he's been out and out and about, occasionally people going up to him and, and not been particularly polite. I think we've seen more of his shed than we have of him. <laughs> I think we need to stop rewarding bad behaviour. It's like the honours list. We're rewarding failure among political advisers. Now David Cameron's set to make however much from publishing a book about how he completely set us up on this crash course. You know, I, do, I think I, I respectfully disagree with you. I think this has a lot to do with David Cameron because the, the referendum that we had didn't give us a clear mandate for anything. It did not give us a mandate for a no-deal Brexit. It didn't give us a mandate for any deal. It also didn't give us a mandate to remain. Obviously, a majority voted to leave. But on what terms? And I think that, yes, I'm disappointed in Parliament's failure to come up with a deal, but I don't think that it's fair to completely blame parliamentarians. They have been trying to square an impossible circle because leaving is much harder than the people were led to believe it would be in the referendum that Cameron devised and I think he he is the one responsible for that we've heard a fair few people <laughs> who have certainly been very critical I mean who here thinks David Cameron absolutely did the right thing back in 2016 yes you stuck your hand right up there the man in the glasses yeah. very decisively he was very clear what it, he said it would be a once in a lifetime in or out referendum but we had a mandate for no deal. What does out mean? Yeah, we had a in, out with a deal, which everybody mean? would prefer, or out with no deal. That's how negotiations work. If you don't like no deal, come to me next time you're selling your house, because I'll take it off you for a quid. <laughs> I've got a question for you, sir, about the general election, because we really need one. Okay. Uh, Do you really want to take us back there? Because we've yeah. done quite a lot on general election. We're talking I've about just David got Cameron. One, one quick, uh, the Labour Party, the Parliamentary Labour Party, more frightened of getting decimated at the polls yes. because they're present polls or, or more frightened of the slight possibility of a Corbyn win. John, I'm going to come to you one second. Let me just hear for this woman here in, in the denim jacket. Hi, um, David Cameron also did say that if we, if Brexit did go ahead, although it wasn't called Brexit then, but if the referendum came back and we were to leave, he also said he would stay on as Prime Minister in very clear terms, and that didn't happen either. Do you wish he had, Brent? Well, actually, <laughs> I, I don't think it's a matter whether I wish, <laughs> wish he did or he didn't. He made it, I think he was quite right. Okay. He took a view that he I'm couldn't see you. through I'm that. I'm teasing you, I'm teasing you. 
John, do you want to reply to that question? Yeah, well, I would say, Charlie, if you do get to sue David Cameron, you'll be at the head of a very long queue for that. <laughs> the, the, the problem has, on this has lain with government not being able to negotiate a good enough deal that was capable, Brandon, of even carrying uh, the majority, all your Tory colleagues with him. And that's the reason uh, they couldn't convince Parliament to give you it the majority. You only vote Conservative, John, no, is that need, what you're saying? We need, we, need a, a, we need a better Brexit deal, but we need to do this. And this is my answer to you, sir. Um, step one, take no deal off the table and we've done it. Step two. Step two, in government, in government, Labour, strike a better Brexit deal. Step three... <laughs> step... <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. People are laughing step... when you say that. I'm sorry. Your it's because it's not possible. Your policy is a fork. Yeah. Step... <laughs> well, in fact, Michel Barnier, the chief negotiator, when, when we did finally get invited to start talking with Theresa May and the Tories, after the end of March, ready to collaborate, as this lady was in, in, encouraging us to, for over a year, Michel Barnier said, look, if the shape of the deal is along the lines that Labour propose, the EU will respond favourably. The deal's there to be done in the mutual interests of the UK and the EU. But because of the failure, the facts of the failure, the increasing division, the vitriol in the views and the way this debate has now gone, the only thing we can do is get the proper deal, put it back to the people so they have the final say. So that is the route out of this mess. Um, Jeffrey, as far as the DUP is concerned, David Cameron actually has been a... Hang on, hang on, don't, please, please, don't, don't, don't shout out. I'm so sorry, because we can't hear when the microphone's not over you. I just want to let uh, Jeffrey answer the question. And, and also, coming back to David Cameron, what's happened subsequently? It's been rather good for the DUP, in that you've had a lot more money, a bit more influence. Well, first of all... It's been a bit of a result, uh, as far as you're concerned. First of all, the money went to the people of Northern Ireland. Um, and, uh, you know, we, after 30 years of the Troubles, we had a serious deficit in terms of investing in our infrastructure. So that money's been going into uh, investing in infrastructure in Northern Ireland, making Northern Ireland a better place um, and, and more fit for purpose for the people of Northern Ireland. We have um, the same deficit and, in Yorkshire. They yeah, do, and, they do and, in Norfolk. Well, and maybe you just haven't been good enough, John, at arguing your case uh, in Parliament. But we've, we've, we have, we uh, have, you know, we do what politicians do, which is to go and make your case for the people that you represent, and you try and get the best deal you can for them. And that's what we've been doing for Northern Ireland, and we'll continue to do that for Northern Ireland. Um, I think that uh, in terms of David Cameron, I have to say, in fairness to him, um, he, he did a lot of work in terms of keeping the peace process moving in Northern Ireland, and we respect him for that. Um, but I do think that um, the difficulty has been, and here I, I do agree with John, that um, uh, over the last uh, th two or three years, we haven't seen a strong enough approach to the negotiations. I think we, we needed to be more assertive in those negotiations about where we were going. And that's why I think we need at least to give the current Prime Minister a chance um, to take this to Brussels to try and get a deal. I think it's possible to get that deal and then bring it back to Parliament. And my challenge to, to John is this. John says that he wants to get a better deal and put it to the people. But I keep here Labour... Labour MPs saying that if there is a referendum, they'll campaign even against their own deal. Kathy, <laughs> uh, okay. briefly, I'm going to try and get another question. How do you think David Cameron will be remembered? Um, I think David Cameron knew that there was a head of steam building up um, and has been effectively since the Maastricht Treaty, that, there, that people hadn't had the chance to legitimise uh, what's been going on in the EU. But I suspect it's not so much David Cameron, it's Theresa May. And the issue was, in the summer of 2016, she could have had the opportunity to bring the two sides together to say, what sort of thing are we looking for going forward? Nothing happened in that summer. It, it, there was no planning going on in terms of how to coordinate and, crucially, how to take things forward in respect of what sort of future arrangement do we want. And so the first that we get to hear was at the Conservative Party conference in October when the red lines were laid down, and it's those red lines that have acted as something of a straitjacket which has limited the possibility for the negotiations going forward. Now, the vast majority of your questions tonight were about Brexit, but there were 
a significant number about this other subject as well, so I'm going to just move off Brexit for a minute. Hold the front page. Um, Philip Hogg, let's hear from you. Should Geoffrey Boycott have been given a knighthood? Afwa. Absolutely not. <laughs> a, knighthood. a knighthood is supposed to be a gesture that recognises valour, traditionally. And there are two reasons why Geoffrey Boycott now certainly should not have been given one. One, because he's been convicted through a court of law of domestic abuse, which sends a message that that is a crime that we do not take sufficiently seriously. We, that when people have committed tax offences, they are, they are denied an honour. But if they have committed domestic abuse, apparently it's fine for them to have one. And secondly, his reaction to being confronted with this conviction, saying that he couldn't give a toss, I feel is the most powerful confirmation of why he's not a fitting person. And I, I think that it's right to single out his case, but it also speaks to a wider problem with our honour system. I don't think political advisers should be receiving honours, especially not for track records of failure. I think the whole system is corrupt and completely at odds with our values as a transparent society. John. No. Uh, this is a man who has been convicted for beating his girlfriend. I think it was a big misjudgment and wrong that Theresa May should want to give him that knighthood. For me, it points to the need for a really a, a, a root and branch overhaul of the honours system. I think it should be there for people who have done big things in their local community, not people who are big names or simply time servers. I should point out that, of course, Geoffrey Boyce, when he said he didn't give a toss, he didn't give a toss about the reaction to him getting the honour, rather the, the conviction re itself. But the is, reaction is what he was, was coming from people who speak about the importance of domestic violence. Does anyone here think Geoffrey Boycott should have got the honour? Anyone? Is a hand up there? Is it yes? Can I respond by saying, first of all, I don't go either way on this. I'm just interested in the panel's um, views, but. One, he was in, convicted in a French court, which different countries, different laws for different things. Oh. Hear me out. Yeah. Let me finish, well, please. Like Scottish judges. Yeah, precisely. He was. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not agreeing with him. Just. Yeah. He was the point. found guilty. People in this country have been found guilty of worse crimes, and 25 years on, they've been basically um, <laughs> forgotten, if you like, because you can actually do. Less than 25 years on a life sentence. Uh, so it's time served for crime committed, if you like. Geoffrey Donaldson, do you think you should have got the honour? Well, uh, first of all, and coming from Northern Ireland, I recognise that sometimes in life people do things that are wrong and come to regret it and say they regret it and say it was wrong, and that's the right thing to do. I mean, Geoffrey Boycott and, has denied that and, he did uh, well, it. Well, I, I, and I agree that um, I think that his reaction to this has been totally the wrong reaction. He's shown no remorse, and I think that uh, he has not helped his case at all in that respect. But we shouldn't also lose sight, I think, that you know, he was a remarkable cricketer. He made an enormous contribution to sport. And I just think it's a shame that he couldn't bring himself to recognise the harm that he had done and to say that it was wrong, accept it was wrong. And I think people might have taken a, a different view if he'd done that. Okay, you're virtually levitating from your seat. You want to get your point across so much. Um, just as in response to this gentleman, Jeffrey, it was reported in the quality press in this country, the broadsheets, this week, that Jeffrey Boycott punched a woman 20 times in her face and body. And it's, it's, referring, it's referring to the, to the court case, which is, yes, which is what we're was, all talking but about. There were photographs from that court case, and that's what he did. He punched a woman in the face and body 20 times. He is a man. He is a strong man. He's a really strong bowler and a cricketer. He is super fit. Is this acceptable? To say that in a foreign court, maybe they're not as tough as they should be, or maybe they're over tough. Since when is it right to punch a woman in the face 20 times and in her body, and then knight him for that? Brandy? 
Do you think he's obviously not being knighted for that? He's being, I presume, no, treated no, as knighted yeah, for his cricketing press. Think, but do you yeah. think he should? Do you agree with him? Well, that he should I, have I, got think, the yeah, I mean, I think um, he's been knighted, as Jeffrey said, for his cricketing stuff. But and do you think he should? But, have been I was going to say, but I, look, I think you, you cannot, in any conditions, at any point, condone support. I don't know what the, there is. A, there's a panel that look at these things, and I don't know what that panel's, why that panel came to view that this was appropriate. I, so I can't comment on there reasoning behind that, but I don't see how you can at any point condone, if somebody's committed that kind of an offence and then not showing the remorse for it, you, ca you can't condone that in any format. The woman there in the red dress. Um, yeah, it comes at a time when the Domestic Abuse Act wasn't passed through Parliament because it got prorogued. I think it's kind of a, a larger symptom of a society that doesn't recognise violence on women. <laughs> Well, well, Boris Johnson has said he's going to bring a domestic violence bill back should he be in, in a position to do so. Yes, the man there at the back. Well, I believe that um, we should just leave it to the Queen. She seems to know us, right? Um, we, we get um, honours for everything these days. We should have just proper honours, birthday honours. <laughs> just leave it to the Queen. Catherine, what do you think about this? Because obviously it's caused some considerable controversy. I mean, I agree with the lady at the front that um, violence against women is totally unacceptable. Uh, he denies it, but nevertheless, he has been convicted of it. I would also agree that the point is, in, in our honours system, it does seem somewhat topsy-turvy that you can get very um, high honours for uh, sports stars and uh, uh, film stars, but for those who are doing the really hard work, the volunteers who are working for um, small um, organisations or charities, they will often only get the lower level honours, and it does seem that it's that latter group upon which society does benefit very much and depend, and I imagine all of us here have been the beneficiaries of it in some form, and of the voluntary time that people have very willingly given up to do that sort of thing. Um, well, I completely agree with um, the woman in front of me in the red dress, what she just said, that um, this is demonstrative of a much wider issue. Um, and I'd just like to pick up John on the fact that when asked about this, um, he responded that it was clearly a problem with the honour system and not a problem with domestic violence and the way that women and women's issues are dealt with by the government and by the rest of the UK. The man there in the blue shirt. Yes. <laughs> Um, I think they should remove the entire cronyism uh, aspect of honours and also the House of Lords as well. And I think when people break the rules and people are proven to be bad people, they should be stripped. Yeah. The Lords, uh, everything, the honour system, once you break the law, have it removed. Why are we honouring you? So get rid of the whole shebang. Well, no, once, they, once they're proven to, to break the law or to do something bad, then remove, remove their honour. I might try and squeeze a couple of points in, if you could be brief. The man in the blue T-shirt there. Yeah, the, the point I was going to make is, obviously, um, this failed Prime Minister has just done a resignation on us, and I understand Mr Lewis there has got a CBE out of the same uh, lot that Geoffrey Boycott has uh, got there. So how do you feel that, you know, how do you feel the value of your honour? Um, well, like, no-one's conflating Geoffrey Boycott with Brendan Lewis, I think. I'm afraid our time is up. I thought we'd end up getting on lots of other subjects, but Brexit was a thing that most of you want to talk about for most of the time, so that is what we did. Our next programme is in Southampton, and the week after that we are in Cardiff. So, you know the drill by now, call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience. We can go to the Question Time website, the instructions are there, and uh, you can follow along uh, with what you see there. And I just want to say, if you want to carry on delving into the world of Brexit, if you haven't had enough, what do you think? <laughs> oh, not so sure. Charlie's definitely had enough. Stick with BBC One and with the hugely popular podcast Brexit Cast, which makes its television debut tonight. It is terrific, and that is with the absolutely brilliant Laura Coonsberg and Katia Adler, and that is on straight after this. But for now, thank you very much to my panel, to my audience here, to all of you, and, of course, to you at home for uh, watching and listening. From Norwich, bye-bye. Stay tuned as we take a lighter-hearted look at the goings-on in Westminster and Brussels, geeky gossip, cheeky chat and maybe even a discussion about biscuits. Brand new Brexit cast is here next. <laughs>